Um, thanks so much. I'm really uh, honored uh, to announce the next talk. Um, it's a Leap's talk titled, as you know, Biotech Health in the Era of Fast Capital. And it's with Erica Chung and Seth Bannon. And I'm not sure who of you uh, have seen the documentary um, where Erica Chung um, has you know, been portrayed as the whistleblower in the Tyrannos case. Um, but it's tremendously interesting. And in her work uh, ever since um, surrounding ethics and entrepreneurship with her organization uh, is truly inspiring. Uh, Seth Bannon, um, who has created a seed fund called 50 Years, um, that is looking at solving some of the greatest challenges that we're facing um, in the world with deep technology. Uh, so two truly inspiring minds. Um, Leap's talk is a series that brings together people like that um, to discuss the impact of technology, but also the ethics around it, the opportunities around it, uh, the challenges around it, specifically in regards to biotechnology. And I'm not sure who has been to the conversation I was honored to have uh, yesterday with the Minister uh, of Digitalization here in Germany. But you know, this question of ethics um, is an important one. Um, and uh, it's one that especially Europe uh, has to address uh, when it comes to technology uh, advancement, since there's different standards across the world, of course, when it comes to that. Um, we're really proud and happy and grateful to partner with BioLeaps on this and the Norskin Foundation on bringing you the Leaps Talk series here at TOUR this year. And I want int to in introduce you to Jürgen Eckert, um, the head of BioLeaps, who will tell you a little bit more about why this conversation is so important at our times. Please give a big hand to our host, Jürgen Eckert. Thank you, Nico, for the introduction and a warm welcome from uh, everybody at uh, Leaps by Bayer. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, for those of you who are not following the biotech news on a daily basis, let me just tell you these are exciting times. Over the last three years, we have seen roughly a doubling of investments in the space. The pace of, ac of, of innovation is really uh, accelerating. And we're getting closer than ever before, actually, in shifting the paradigm in medicine from treating diseases to actually curing diseases and uh, restoring, uh, restoring health of patients. So uh, we at uh, Bayer really believe it's our, it's our responsibility to support the development of such uh, breakthrough technologies which uh, can benefit you know, patients and uh, ultimately all of us on this, uh, on this planet. Uh, and to that end, we have uh, created Leaps by Bayers, uh, uh, Leaps by Bayer roughly uh, uh, three years ago. We have uh, invested more than $900 million in various uh, startups, joint ventures that are pursuing uh, the development of such breakthrough uh, technologies with you know, noble goals such as uh, curing cancer, uh, restoring less se uh, lost cell function, in uh, patients who have, for example, who are blind or who are suffering from heart failure, restoring health for, us, for patients with, uh, with such diseases. Now, while we are supporting the development of, uh, of such breakthrough technologies, we obviously also realize that they can be viewed uh, controversial and uh, that we have to uh, pursue those technologies with utmost transparency and uh, responsibility. Um, and that's where really these, uh, these leaps talk, the, the leaps talks are, are so important for us because we believe the, the, uh, the discussion uh, around, the, uh, around these ethical questions shouldn't really be left to the, um, to the experts, you know, the scientists, the investors or the regulators. We believe society at large should be included in, in those discussions. Uh, so everybody in this room and everybody outside of this room should basically hear about, worry about, and uh, and and take uh, and participate in those in those discussions. Um, so that's what we're here for, and uh, I look forward to the to the panel discussion that we're going to have in a in a second. Um, I would like to thank Seth and Erica for joining us on the panel. I would like to thank Nico and the entire Toa team for for having us. And um, uh, also would like to uh, thank the Norsken Foundation for doing this uh, together with us. 
So without further ado, let me uh, ask the panelists to join us and uh, I hope we'll have a great discussion. Thank you. Hi everyone, so I'm Alistair. Thank you, Jürgen, for taking the time to introduce us. I wanted to introduce Erica um, Chum, right here, who's gonna be giving a short presentation um, and to basically introduce the topic a little bit. Seth will do the same after, and then we'll have some questions after that and a short discussion. All right, wonderful. Um, I wanna first say thank you to uh, Bayer, one for dealing with my American accent when pronu pronouncing your uh, your company name and for inviting me here and the whole TOA team for uh, having me here today. And thank you to all of you for being here. So I kind of wanted to get a sense for you guys when you're thinking about you know, the next generation of healthcare and the next generation of patient care, how many of you guys think that this is gonna come from you know, traditional biotech companies and pharma? Can I get a, a show of hands from all you guys? How many of you think? No one, no one, yeah, maybe. So how many of you think that'll come from tech companies and startups? <laughs> okay, well, here is the majority of people. So I think all of us have sort of seen kind of infographs and in the media sort of talking about how tech is coming in to pharma and biotech and they're gonna disrupt and revolutionize things. And as kind of uh, frustrating as that term has, has seemed to become because it's so overused, there are a lot of really interesting things going on with how tech is interfacing with healthcare. And some examples of this is, of course, Google AI has come up with an algorithm that is able to detect breast cancer at a 99% accuracy rate in lymph nodes, which is leaps and bounds better than a very experienced doctor is, is able to experience. And also we're seeing, um, you know, 3D printing is not as such a hot topic anymore, but there's this great organization called the Rapid Foundation that is using 3D printing to produce custom low cost prosthetics um, to give access to low income and rural communities. And lastly, you know, you can't talk about innovation without talking about CRISPR. And though there are a wealth of things going on for CRISPR entering into the therapeutic space, another interesting company is Mammal, Mammoth Biosciences that's looking, about, uh, looking at how to leverage uh, CRISPR for diagnostics. So say there's another big uh, infectious disease outbreak like Ebola or some sort of flu, what you could potentially have are these sort of point of care diagnostics that passengers can test to see, you know, did I manage to get Ebola and can we stop this from spreading to, to other countries? So all this stuff, really interesting, really cool, very exciting things kind of going on at this intersection between technology and healthcare. And for me, this was the impetus to also join one of these exciting tech companies that were interfacing with healthcare. So I had worked for a blood diagnostic company and essentially this blood diagnostic company was trying to take a finger stick to run all the blood panels that you would do at a hospital normally. And instead of getting a venous straw, you get the finger stick, you get your small sample of blood, you would stick it into a machine about the size of a printer, it would run all your tests and then on your phone, you would get all your results. So this sounds like a, a, a fantastic vision for the way in which we can, you know, as consumers be empowered to, to know what our health status is and, and really get a dynamic look about what's going on within our body. And does anyone by any chance know what the name of this company was that I worked for? Can anyone shout it out? Theranos. Yeah, so it was Theranos. So Theranos, for you, those of you that don't know, is also one of the largest scandals coming out of the United States. And it uh, was a company that despite raising 700 million US dollars did not produce this machine that they had claimed that they had. And, um, you know, largely I, th th there was a problem of sort of not producing this test, but the other issue that sort of 
was coming about was the technology, this clicker is not cooperating. The other issue was the sort of underdeveloped technology that they had. They decide to move fast, launch it to the market, and start testing on patients before it was developed or vetted or ready. So essentially, we were iterating on patients without their consent. We were experimenting on real life people every day, telling them, you have syphilis, you don't have syphilis, you have syphilis, when we really had no idea. It was, could have been just as accurate as me pointing a finger. And this is generally what we were doing within, uh, within the laboratory. So, you know, coming from this experience, Theranos is a particularly spectacular case. If any of you have followed it, there's an HBO documentary, there's a book by John Kerry Rue, the journalist who broke the story, um, that's filled with all these elements. And I was hoping that this was potentially a one-off scandal, that this was just a one-time thing. But really, what we're seeing is that there are numerous other cases kind of coming about. So recently, there was Ubiome, which is a uh, microbiology diagnostic test that were effectively charging patients $2,700 or their insurers $2,700 when the test was only supposed to cost $89. And they were also charging patients insurers for tests that were never run. So this company you know, raised $600 million from some of really prolific uh, investors in the Silicon Valley like Andreessen Horowitz. And there, of course, is another case. There was Zenefits. So Zenefits was selling health insurance to consumers. And instead of doing a simple 52-hour training, compliance training for their brokers to make sure, hey, the insurance that we're selling to these patients, are they going to get the care that they need if they get injured? They created a macros to basically run their training without actually putting in the hours. Um, and also, you know, faced charges with the SEC and, and ended up getting fines for doing that. And the interesting thing about all three of these cases is these are some of the most well-funded companies within the Valley. You know, these were really some stars that we were looking at in, in San Francisco as being these case holds for where technology meets healthcare. So what's, what's kind of an underlying theme or problem that's going on here? And a big argument that I'm making is basically there isn't an emphasis or even a discussion really about ethics when it comes to where tech meets healthcare. And um, I think one of the benefits about big pharma companies and biotech companies, like at this point they've faced either lawsuits or <laughs> you know, regulator regulators and lawyers and everything that they've really had to put this at the forefront of their business because they know about risk management, they know that they need to ensure patient safety and everything else. But for technologists, this hasn't really been uh, a conversation. And a lot of these three cases that you've seen, one of the common threads is the fact that what they did was uh, effectively try and figure out how to evade regulators and evade these processes and these um, laws, basically, that are meant to protect vulnerable populations. So the hunch is that to correct this problem, you need to create regulations to sort of come down on people and say, you need to play by the rules. But really what we're seeing, it doesn't matter what rules you set up. And you know, for us at Ethics and Entrepreneurship, a big thing that we're doing is really trying to build this campaign of encouraging people actually within their organizations to create ethical culture. Because this is really going to be the first step for people to apply regulations to their organizations to make sure that the programs that they implement, whether that's diversity and inclusion programs, sexual harassment programs, or just creating projects, uh, the products that are patient-centric, you really have to stand as, as a company and say, we want to have an ethical culture within our organization. So luckily, we partnered with an amazing organization called Ethical Systems in New York to provide a sort of diagnostic test for these companies to examine what are these disqualifying agents to ethical culture and these sort of qualifying agents within their organization and kind of get a stance of where they stand um, as a company. So um, I want to get into the Q&A, and uh, uh, I wanted to leave all the people who are innovators in healthcare with uh, a very good quote from, from Merck who said, medicine is for the patient. We try and never forget that medicine is for the people. It's not for the profits. The profits will follow 
if you remember that medicine is for the patient and um, you know, when we've remembered that fact, uh, the, the prophets have never failed to appear. So thank you. So Erica uh, talked a lot about uh, tech moving into bio, uh, and I am, I'm one of those people. I used to run a software startup that I was the founder of, and now I run a VC fund uh, that invests in bio companies. We've invested in over 20. The fund is called uh, 50 Years. We invest in deep technology companies that can both make a lot of money and do a lot of good in the world. And so it's really important to us that our companies both move very quickly, but also do things the right way. So this is a phrase that many of you have probably heard, move fast and break things. It was famously a motto of Facebook and in many ways is a motto of Silicon Valley software. They're simple words, but what exactly do they mean? Uh, in order to enlighten you, I want to talk a little bit about the history of startups and software development. Uh, and I want to start in the 90s. Uh, the 90s were a crazy time. Uh, software development and startups looked very different than they do today. The, the modus operandi was to raise a super large amount of money, hire a really, really big team, take a really, really long time, have a really, really big party, and then launch a product. This is a lot of fun, but the problem with this way of developing software is that you often end up with no one that actually wants to use it. And so a lot of people wasted a lot of time, a lot of talent, a lot of money, and a lot of energy. And so there's a new way of building companies called lean methodology. And lean methodology has really taken over Silicon Valley. Very simply, the basic premise is that you talk to your customers or users as quickly as possible, and then you build the smallest, even silliest thing you can that they will use and pay for. You launch it even if it's broken and buggy, because after you launch, you can hear what's broken about it and fix it. And this actually makes a lot of sense for software, because if you're developing a photo sharing app or an enterprise sales tool or a social networking whatever, it's no big deal that part of it is broken. You might have a couple annoyed users, but that's it. So Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, famously encapsulated this idea by saying, if you're not embarrassed by the first product you launch, you waited too long to launch. And again, Facebook incorporated it into the motto of their company. And the basic idea here is that you want to optimize for speed over quality. And in the software sense, it, make, it makes a lot of sense because the downsides of speed, maybe introducing a buggy product and having annoyed users, are greatly outweighed by the advantages of speed, the pace of learning you get from actually launching and listening to customers. So that's how this mentality crept into the world of software. Now I want to talk a little bit about the history of biotech. Biotech traditionally has meant one thing, small molecule drug development. You find chemical compounds that have therapeutic properties. You optimize those compounds. You take them through preclinical, through phase one, through phase two, through phase three. And then hopefully at the end of this, you get regulatory approval and you're really happy and created a lot of value, or you don't, and you're really sad and didn't. And in this model of business building, lean startup's not really an option. It's really hard to talk to customers before you have clinical data. It's a very binary thing where you either have created value or you haven't. And it's really hard to launch something and iterate and get feedback, because you legally can't do that. But there's a rise of a new type of biotech company. 
There's computational biology companies where a lot of what's traditionally done in a wet lab with scientists is now being done in silicon with computers. There are synthetic biology companies that are engineering microbes to be living therapeutics. And there's new diagnostics technology that allows companies to make very cheap devices that have very high accuracies. These companies can actually incorporate lean methodologies. So should we adopt, move fast, and break things for biotech? Well, not exactly. Crib notes, moving fast, good, breaking things in bio, bad. So if your photo app is broken, you might have some annoyed users. You might have busy customer support staff, but it's not going to be a really big deal. But if your diagnostic tool on which people are making life or death decisions is broken, you might lead to people dying. This is a pretty stark difference. So I'm going to talk about a few ways move fast and break things applies to bio, and a few ways it should not. So one easy way is talking to customers early. This is something all founders should do even before you start your company. Talk to customers, see what their needs are, see how much they'll pay for those needs, and then only start building once you have a firm idea of what's necessary. You can design, build, and test, and repeat this cycle very quickly. Essentially, what this means is you want to have hypotheses, a list of all your hypotheses. You want to figure out the quickest, cheapest, smallest tests you can build to either validate or invalidate those hypotheses, and then run those as quickly as possible, as often as possible. In your R&D process, in the part of the company or team that's the tip of the spear that's figuring out new things, you should optimize for speed over process. It's OK for the R&D team to make mistakes. And you should sell fast. Figure out the smallest niche of customers and the smallest iota of a thing you can sell them and start selling. So what doesn't apply? This is an obvious one. Don't launch faulty products. Uh, unlike the photo sharing case, launching a faulty product as a biotech company has real world consequences that are irre irreversible. In the production process, on the production team, optimize for process over speed. That's the flip of the R&D team. The production team should make sure that QC is ver done very, very well and that no faulty products are actually making it out into the world. And don't ignore regulators. Embrace regulators. There have been a lot of software companies that have had a lot of success, like Airbnb and Uber, saying, you know what, we know better than regulators. We're going to launch and we're going to force them to adopt our view of the world. Do not do this as a biotech company. I've been shocked in dealing with the FDA with how impressive they are. These are incredibly smart people who are well-intentioned, who understand what it means to build new technology, and who, not, who care not just about keeping patients safe, but actually care about getting them solutions quickly. So Facebook actually changed that motto, move fast and break things, to this motto. It's, it's less catchy. Move fast with stable infrastructure. <laughs> so maybe in biotech, our motto should be move fast with safety first. But why are we talking about moving fast at all? 17 million 100,000 people. This is the number of people that die every year from cardiovascular disease. And to put this into context, since I started talking, this is 300 people that have passed away. It's incredibly important that we get these solutions out into the world quickly. So let's figure out how to move fast with safety first. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Erica. Those are both incredibly interesting. Can we just get another round of applause, actually, please? Thank you. Um, so we talked a little bit about, uh, Erica talked in particular about some of the problems that you face with ethi as the ethical background behind these types of investments or these types of companies. And Seth talked a little bit about the differences in development between tech and life sciences. So maybe we could talk a little bit about investment. Over the last couple of years, as Jürgen mentioned um, in his opening talk, there's been a hell of a lot of investment into biotech. It's doubled almost over the last three years. So 
what have been the changes you've seen in investor mindsets and activity over the last three years, which has sort of fueled this boom? And do you think it's going to continue? Um, maybe Eric could, could speak first and then Seth after. Yeah, so I, you know, I've been mostly based in, in, in Asia and seen like a complete onslaught between government and investment trying to encourage the biotech industry as well as VC sort of moving into the space. Um, the, un, you know, the issue is a lot of tech investors are now moving into the biotech space trying to sort of use the same principles that they've used for say an internet company for biotech. And they're still looking at these time cycles that are about you know, a three year turnover when it's like no biotech because of the need for abiding by the sort of regulatory cycle of, of just needing to act slowly in, in certain scenarios can't sort of work by these same time frames and same time schedules. Yeah, I mean, there's interesting things happening. I'm going to read this this tweet. Uh, so Walter Isaacson, who's a very famous biographer, uh, wrote the biography of Steve Jobs. Uh, this was, I think, today or yesterday. He said the the first half of the 20th century was shaped by physics, the second half by information technology and microchips, and the first half of the 21st century will be shaped most by biotech. Right? So I think there's sort of two things happening. There's a, a realization among traditional technology investors that you can't just ignore bio, that there's going to be a lot of value created and a lot of problem solved with biology. And second, the tools of Silicon Valley are more relevant than ever in the world of biotech. We were talking earlier about the potential for computational drug discovery. Right. So a lot of what used to just require a PhD in a lab with a pipette uh, just manually moving things back and forth can either now be done through automation, which is uh, something that Silicon Valley is quite good at, or computationally. Um, on top of that, we're starting to understand that the code of a microbe is very similar to the code of a computer. Um, and as we understand more and more about it, we can manipulate it in the same ways we can manipulate a software program. And so I think it's actually a really healthy thing that these two worlds are coming together because I think it'll lead to solutions getting out into the world much more quickly. But I, I do agree that there's a lot of tensions. A lot of the Silicon Valley investors don't understand that bio takes time. Um, you know, software is, is such that if you just spend a few all-nighters, you can force progress, right? You can just have a hackathon, keep working, and, and make a product and get it out there over a weekend. You can't make biology move faster, right? Cells need time to grow. Biology needs time to, to unfold. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the sort of traditional biotech investors don't fully understand the power of some of these computational methods, of some of these high throughput auto autom automation methods. And so I think those two worlds coming together is going to lead to something, I hope, very healthy. Yeah. And I think when there's a convergence of any two communities that sort of speak a different language, there's always that initial tension point of, of yep. learning each other's language, of learning people's different agendas and what their priorities are. I mean, in this case, KPIs, for example, are a great example of that. You know, I, working at Bayer, which is obviously a very large company, we have a different set of understanding of KPIs and key performance indicators to a startup. And trying to combine those two things together, particularly in something like bio, it's, it's pretty difficult. And to Seth's point earlier, when you put in technology as well and software business models and everything else, it gets to be quite overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So perhaps basically off that, we've talked a little bit about investment now. And we've, we talked about investment because in bio, I suppose, the biggest risk is actually technical risk. You know, you're trying to solve a scientific problem, which actually at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how much money you throw at it. If the science doesn't work, it doesn't work. So maybe we could talk a little bit about what other than money, what other than investment would be required to sort of improve this system, to get people to talk to, you know, work better together, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you have to fact check the science, right? You have to go in there and there has to be better sort of checks and balances for these companies, especially tech companies that largely remain private for a long time. There's incentives to sort of be in stealth mode and everything else. How do we make sure that within these organizations, they're producing good science and that that is vetted and verified by not only themselves, but external agencies. And there's kind of a consensus of like, okay, this is built on a strong scientific foundation. So you would advocate for stronger due diligence basically and um, than, than the current standard. Yeah. Stronger due diligence. Um, also just making sure that you work with partners that are able to sort of fact check you and, and make sure that there's uh, the, the the studies that you're running are replicable, right? That it's not just sort of being able to be run in your own organization. 
um, and, and that you get a, a varied opinion about, you know, what are the considerations in the tech and the products that you're building? What are the consequences that they might have for uh, patients or for society or downstream, you know? Kind of where we do these moonshot ideas for building products, what are the moonshot consequences of when you launch this into the public? What, what very far into the future could they potentially have in using that same ideology? I think you agree. Uh, I, I, I do. I think one of the biggest things that I think the, the field needs aside from capital is an easier off-ramp from academia to the world of entrepreneurship. Um, so right now, almost everything you learn that makes you a great PhD, that makes you a great researcher, makes you a, a bad founder. Right? It's really difficult to make that transition. A lot of the muscle memory that you need um, uh, makes it really hard to uh, slip into the world of entrepreneurship. And so I, I would love to see either programs or more materials that would help more PhDs start companies. So I think we would get a lot more solutions a lot more quickly. I also think that PhDs running these companies is a really uh, great thing. I think that, you know, it was interesting in the, in the 90s, which I talked about a bit, the default was you would take the nerds who were the software developers and the nerds would build a cool tool. And then the VCs would come in and they'd go, oh, look, the nerds built something cool. Let's hire a real man to run this company. And they would hire a Harvard MBA. And that guy would run the company and manage the nerds. Right? And then at some point, people realize, oh, you know what? The nerds can run the company themselves. Um, and sure, it takes a lot for them to learn how to become great CEOs. But if they do, the companies are run in, much, in a, in a much better, actually. Much better. And I think if we saw the same thing happening in biotech, which still has that old model of bring someone in to run the company, I think these companies would, would, would move faster, and I think we'd see a lot less scandals. And so maybe on that side, you, you mentioned, you know, this translational efforts that people have between academia and, you know, either starting a company or, or just generally going into entrepreneurship. I, th I feel personally, at least in my line of work um, for what we do with Bayer, within Bayer, actually there's a lot more companies that are not necessarily coming out, out of academia anymore due to the democratization of science. You know, there's, there's this place, your targets don't necessarily need to come for a drug at least, the target being like a gene or a, a pathway that you can use to affect a certain disease. That doesn't necessarily need to come from an academic center anymore. It could come from a hospital. It could come from a company. It could come from all sorts of different things. Do you think that you know, the, the mentality that founders have needs to be consistent, um, whether they're in academia or outside of that, if they're getting targets or you know, IP this way? I, I think that the mindset of a great founder is, is, is the same, whether, no matter where you're coming from. Um, Although I would love to see these, I would love to see these companies that you're seeing. I, I, in our experience, the the vast majority of interesting biotech companies are still being spun out of out of out of labs. It's typically a couple of um, PhDs that have worked for four to five years on a technology. Um, they think they've figured out most of maybe the science questions. Now there's just some sort of engineering questions, um, and so they're spinning it out and turning it into a commercial entity and, and pushing it forward. Um, and I do think that a lot of the tools of science and a lot of the knowledge of science is getting democratized, and so I would certainly love to live in a world where um, these companies didn't need to come from academia, but that, that hasn't yet been, been my experience. Maybe it's just because I'm not seeing what you're seeing. Hmm. It's just the valley, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eric? Yeah, I mean, I, we kind of see a similar thing with in Asia. Majority of them are coming out of academia. A lot of the the issue with these scientists is sort of right on point with what you said. They're not really trained in entrepreneurship, and because at least from our side, you know, the Chinese government, the Hong Kong government, majority of these governments have come in and said we want to invest in these biotech companies, but there are no biotech companies to be had. They go and try and pick out these scientists, but they're like grossly underprepared because many of them have just worked in academia. There aren't a long standing biotech companies that they go and work for and develop their skills. Um, so there has to be some sort of emphasis and training for these technical people to understand what it's like to go from, you know, something in a, in a Petri dish to then building and scaling out a company. No, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I think one thing that we could, uh, which as well that I wanted to ask you guys of your opinions on is that we talk, we've talked a lot about this intersection between tech and life sciences. And we've talked about it usually in the context of either traditional life sciences businesses, meaning crop science, pharmaceuticals, diagnostics, et cetera. However, as we've advanced in technology, there is now uses of, for life sciences in a whole load of different areas. For example, biocomputing, DNA storage, et cetera, which 
are not necessarily the same level of scrutiny as you would have in, in healthcare, but also operate on this intersection between tech and life sciences. Do you feel that we need the same level of ethics for these types of businesses, or is it very dependent on the end user being a patient or a consumer, basically? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. I've, so I, I would say there's, when we say ethics, there's sort of two domains, right? There's part of what Erica talked about, which is that you, you, you operate with integrity, you treat your employees well, you respect your customers, your stakeholders. That, I think, no matter what domain you're operating in, no matter what you're building, you should, you should adhere to. Um, and then there's a bit more sort of what I talked about, which is, you know, maybe don't launch faulty products and all this jazz. And I think for, for, for something like, you know, DNA data storage, where the worst case is maybe someone has to go and get their tape back up. Right, that kind of uh, of company building I I is acceptable, right? A and maybe might be the best way of getting that tool out to the masses most quickly. Um, and, and so yeah, so I think that there, there, the, the tension doesn't exist quite as much. Um, we actually have a company called Catalog DNA, which is uh, I would say the leaders in DNA data storage, and they have no intention of la launching faulty products. But I wouldn't be as upset with them if they did that as some of our healthcare companies. Um, but then you, you you have some other companies. So one of our companies is called Solugen. They use enzymes to make industrial chemicals, right? And so f for them, uh, they do adhere to the same sort of level of scrutiny as, a, as our healthcare companies, right? Because if you're, if you're actually uh, putting chemicals out into the world uh, that aren't what, what you say they are, right? That, that has really, really, really bad consequences. Yeah, and it's always hard to tell with these things, right? Because you don't know what the sort of evolution of that company is gonna look like over time. So it's kind of one of these things that you don't really know what the consequence of a technology is or the way that you've structured your company until it's kind of gotten too far. So it's, it's really thinking about, okay, what can we forecast and see what the potential effects of how you grow the company would look like? Like what would the, the systems, the structures, the governance look like for this? But it's really one of those things that you don't realize until you look at it in hindsight, unfortunately. So, so we'll see kind of what, what that landscape kind of looks like over time. And so maybe this is a question more for Erica, I guess. Do you think that that dichotomy will change in the US versus say Asia? Well, the dichotomy of uh, of just of, of how people view investments like this, due to the fact that you know in the U.S. and Europe we're very centric on what we really described for pharmaceutical development before, which is yeah. based off some molecule development. Asia doesn't really have that same yeah. constraint. Yeah, there isn't that same constraint. We'll, we'll kind of see, right? Because I think uh, at the end of the day, Asia wants to produce products that are not only relevant for its own region and its own area, but also that it could be exportable to the rest of the world. And you know we've seen this with, with China really trying to clean up its act and, and showing that, hey, we can produce really high quality products that they've been tested safely for use in patients. And um, therefore, you can actually trust the things that we developed to then go on into other markets. So, so it's, it's kind of hard to say, but it seems generally, at least for China, Southeast Asia is very fragmented and it doesn't quite have the same. Um, Rigorous uh, levels of control. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so we'll see kind of what they what they do with this. But they're all, well, yeah. There's kind of crazy cases in general. At China's a, it's it could be its own session, uh, really. Yeah, I, I, I might. So one one of the things that you hear a lot is that um, you know, like say that the Chinese don't have the same level of ethics as as the West when it comes to something like regulating therapeutics. And so I, I was recently in in Beijing and Shanghai, and I was able to meet with a lot of Chinese biopharma companies and some, some minister level regulators. And I walked away with, the, with thinking that they actually have the same exact level of ethics, it's just a slightly different ethics, yeah. right? So, so they think in a much more collectivist way. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, say you have a, a, a gene therapy that can treat a disease where 10,000 people a year die. And in order to go into to clinical, you, know, you think maybe half of the people might, might die of this gene therapy, right? It would be really hard to get approval for that because they go, oh, that's too dangerous, right? In China, they say, okay, well, hold on, 10,000 people a year are dying now if we do nothing. How many people will die potentially in this you know, clinical trial? And then they just do the math, right? And they say, oh, well, you know, although it's very dangerous, this will actually potentially end up saving more lives, so let's let this go forward. Yep. So it's a bit more utilitarian, I it's guess. It's much more utilitarian. And so I actually think that they have a very strong sense of ethics that's just different than, than the ethics we have in the West. And I, I, I would agree with that personally as well. Yeah. Um, so perhaps lastly, before we go to the, um, the open Q&A, I guess, um, what over the next 50 years is the most is is the technology you feel that's going to have the most ethical considerations around it? It could be healthcare, it could be anything really. But I mean, and, and to both of you, actually, I know this is a bit more for Seth in some senses. Yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, as a whole, the thing I'm most excited about is um, business moving away from this thing called the Friedman Doctrine. So it's basically this, this idea put forward by this Nobel Prize winning economist, Milton Friedman, who um, wrote this op-ed in the, in the New York Times in 1930 called The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. Mm -hmm. um, and in this essay, you should all read it, it reads like a parody. Um, he literally says that if you're a business person, he didn't say business, he said businessman, uh, and, and, you, uh, <laughs> and you're considering anything besides profit, and he literally says, for instance, the welfare of your employees, the good of your customers, the health of the environment. If you those small little uh, these small th yeah. things. If you if you consider any of those things, you are undermining the basis of free society. Ah, of course. And so it's absurd, but this is actually how most of business thinks, right? They think that their responsibility is to increase shareholder value, and that and that alone. And so the thing I'm most excited about in technology and business is is this Friedman doctrine being being sort of kicked to the side of the road and replaced with an idea of business that says that you should absolutely consider all of those things in, in running your business in addition to to profit. Okay, and Erica? Next 50 years, so in terms of like the ethical considerations of the so technology that we're gonna be developing? Not, not so much the, uh, the, technology, uh, the, the considerations around the technology, more which yeah. technology itself do you think could be, is it in healthcare, is it in crop sciences, is it in? <sighs> I mean, there's so many, right? Like you can't, again, it's like you always look at these things in hindsight of what they could develop. Uh, I into, I mean, you know, there's the case for CRISPR, right? Like, w you know, back in the day when we had in vitro fertilization and we did the first kind of implanted baby, everyone was up in arms, right? They were freaking out, like, this is so unnatural and this is so um, uh, strange. And really there was that one successful case of they were able to actually conceive of this child and everyone was like, okay, that's not so bad. But now we're seeing this with things like CRISPR, right? Where we're now gene editing children and babies and, and now we have three that have this sort of edited genes for this HIV marker that we'll see what kind of um, becomes of that. But this is gonna be a really interesting conversation, I think. You know, CRISPR is one of the big things that what's going to become of this when we start gene editing embryos and, and what are the consequences of that for society and the way that we conceive children and what we deem as normal and non-normal and the way we kind of no longer have a diversification of, of individuals potentially and just uh, kind of produce very streamlined. Yeah, so, so this is something I find really, you know, sci-fi-esque and, and, and interesting. So we'll see what that develops in the next 50 years. Fantastic. Um, so I'm being told the time is up. So can we get another round of applause for our amazing panelists, Erica and Seth, please? <laughs>